I think the more virulent contagion that the world has to deal with is the Chinese Communist Party itself. Its lack of transparency, its, uh, the, its habitual secrecy, the bureaucrats and the officials desire to cover their behinds and they're afraid to report bad news because they don't want to uh, invoke the displeasure of the emperor. Uh, that's, that's what led to this outbreak. That, that's what led it to get out of hand in the first place. And, uh, and, and we've seen that the influence of the Chinese Communist Party and its authoritarian governing uh, style is infecting. It goes far beyond the borders of China. Just how is the coronavirus outbreak in China affecting global supply chains? How does this inform decisions and risk associated with offshoring manufacturing to China? And will the COVID-19 outbreak impact the Phase 1 China trade deal? This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Jan Jekielek. In this episode, we'll sit down with Curtis Ellis, Policy Director with America First Policies. He was also a senior policy advisor with Donald Trump's 2016 presidential campaign. Curtis Ellis, great to have you back on American Thought Leaders. It's wonderful to be back, Jan. Curtis, a couple of op-eds that you wrote recently caught my eye. And, you know, everyone is talking about coronavirus right now, or COVID-19 as it's been recently named. But you took it, you took looking at it through the lens of perhaps economics or disruptions mm -hmm. in trade, which is, of course, you know, one of yours, if special specialization. Um, tell me more about what you're seeing. Well, what I'm seeing and wondering about is the impact this will have, the coronavirus will have, on our current system of global supply chains and what I would call globalism or corporate globalization. There's been this uh, reigning uh, philosophy from the Harvard Business School on down that every corporation should be stretching out its production lines as far as possible. So we have globe straddling multinational corporations that take the resources from country A, combine them with resources from country B, assemble them in country C, and then ship them to the markets in country D. And this is actually a fairly new development in most of the history of America. You would have manufacturing done within America. They would take the resources from Minnesota, combine them with the coal in Pennsylvania, make steel in Pittsburgh, uh, maybe ship it to Buffalo or Detroit to make the cars that were then sold within the United States and exported to other parts of the world. And then the next step was other countries would say, well, if you want to sell American cars, if you want to sell Ford automobiles in Europe, well, you have to make them in Europe. And so they would make cars in Europe to sell in Europe, make cars in Japan to sell in Japan, make cars in China to sell in China, which makes a certain, which makes a lot of sense, having production close to the consumers. But as I said, this is now transmorphed, tra transmuted, transformed into global supply chains, where you marry that with the logistics arrangement of just-in-time inventory management, okay. where companies no longer keep huge warehouses filled with inventory, whether it's inventory of raw materials, inventory of subcomponents, right. or inventory of finished goods. Everything is delivered to the factory just in time to be used in the production process there and then shipped on to the next stage of the production or assembly process just in time. So it, it keeps the carrying costs at a minimum. But what we're seeing now, thanks to the coronavirus, is if you have an interruption in the supply chain because of factories being closed in China, people can't get, are, are unable to get to work because they're quarantined or they're, they're ordered to stay in their house, we're now seeing Automobile factories in South Korea closed because they can't get auto parts that are made in China. Apple computers. Not only have they closed all their stores in China, which represents 15% of their global income, the retail sales, but they have cut shipments of iPhones globally by 10% 
because they can't get the workforce in their plants in China to assemble the iPhones. And they have a couple of other products that were supposed to come online and be available for sale around the world later this year. The delivery date for those has slipped back because of the inability, because all of their supply chains are now wholly dependent or largely dependent on China. And there's been a disruption in this production in China. So I'm asking to what degree will this affect global supply chains in a number of industries and will it change, and I would hope it does change the thinking of the management consultant business school types and question the very premise of having global supply chains and this you know, great logistics management superstructure and, and, and let's get back to having uh, decentralized and uh, not sole source suppliers centered in China, but let's have decentralized supply chains. Let's have production closer to the consumer once again. So America could produce and would produce more of what's consumed in America. And the same would go for other countries as well. So. You know, obviously the situation in, uh, in Wuhan and in China and so forth, we're seeing it's becoming more and more dire. But this is, you're, you're kind of saying that this is kind of offers an opportunity. It's kind of like gives us, a, a, exposes us to the reality of how these chains work and the risk associated with that. that right. Uh, when I was a child, one of the first uh, uh, aphorisms or old adages that I was taught is don't put all your eggs in one basket. But what we've seen now is companies like Apple and many other companies have put all their eggs in one basket. That basket is China. Uh, they've not only, it, it, I, I think they were, uh, they would try to sell it as we are diversifying our supply chain. Well, it's an odd choice of word. They've, they, they diversified it away from the United States, but what they've done is they've concentrated it in China. As I learned through watching American thought leaders, 90% of the ingredients that go into our medicines are sourced from China. And this is a, a beautiful irony or a horrible irony. Now that we have this health emergency and should it ever strike the United States, uh, the, the medicine we need to cure, uh, the medicines we need to cure at least the symptoms, if we don't know what the cure is for the actual disease, are coming from China. But here's more to the point, which is very much the point of the coronavirus, face masks and the, and the gowns, the protective garments. Right. Most of those are made in China. The world's supply of face masks is made in China. China has now declared these a strategic resource. So if some other country in the world had an outbreak on the scale that China does and needed face masks, they very likely would not be able to get them because China right. is the only place they're made. Now, I believe that if you went to Harvard Business School and submitted a case study or a business plan and said, my business plan is to have a sole supplier, my, my business that I'm projecting here will be entirely dependent on one supplier for its existence and its longevity and its ability to compete. I have a feeling the professors would say, that's a very bad idea. Go back to the drawing board. But that is very much the position we are in, in so many industries. We've seen a concentration, not only a concentration of ownership in the monopolization and concentration of ownership in industries, we've seen a concentration of production in one country, China. And that's really a dangerous position to be in. Back in the 1930s, President Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, before World War II broke out, was concerned about the concentration of ownership of the strategic industries that would be required to produce steel, battleships, tanks, machine guns. It was all centered around Pittsburgh. Okay. Right, because that's where the coal was, that's where the steel was, that's where the machining was. All of the, the heavy industry that would go into defending our country in a military uh, confrontation was 
consolidated in one in, in, in one man's hands. And he thought that was a dangerous situation to be in. Well, right now, all of the resources to defend our country against a medical or health emergency are concentrated in one country, in China. And that's not, not a good place to be. And I would hope that this, I would hope that, the, of course, that this virus outbreak is settled soon, that there's no great loss of life, and that everyone recovers and is well. But I, at the same time, I hope that the leaders of our country, the political leaders and of our industry, take the lesson that it is not good to be dependent on one country and to have so much of our productive capacity and so many of our industries dependent on communist China as a source for the goods and, and, their, and their financial well-being as well. Well, you know, and especially a country which we're increase, increasingly realizing, even in the popular consciousness, you know, doesn't have America's or frankly the free world's best interests in mind. That's right. This is a country which it, there, it is no exaggeration to say they are hostile to the values of Western democracy. They are the sworn enemy of Western democracy. And the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party has made it very clear through their propaganda organs that they see their system of top-down authoritarian techno-surveillance, social credit scoring, the whole thing, they see that as a superior system to Western democracy and a system that the rest of the world should emulate. Now, by their own words, they have position themselves as the sworn enemy of Western democracy. So for Western industrial democracies to make themselves dependent on a country like that is, is absolute foolishness. It, 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 it's absolute foolishness. I would also say this, that another thing we've learned from the coronavirus outbreak is how matters that are considered economic, such as means of production, the, the, the investment and uh, return on capital, and the smooth functioning of the world economy or any economic production, rests on a foundation which is outside of purely economic uh, criteria. It, it, it rests on a foundation of good governance, of open information, of the reliability of, uh, of the information. Uh, there's a lot of economic doctrine that talks about the, the, rational, the rational man theory and that uh, uh, markets require uh, access to information. Uh, well, I would say that we see now through the coronavirus outbreak that the smooth functioning of production and the smooth fr functioning of the economy requires openness of information because there's been a distinct lack of openness of information, which led to this outbreak, which has led to the disruption of the supply chains and the production. So when the masters of industry, the captains of industry and the, the masters of the universe on Wall Street consider where they're going to invest the capital, where they're going to build the factories, where they're going to basically risk the future of their companies, they need to take into account things like governance, How's the governance in those countries? Are they open about information? Can we count on them to be honest when something bad goes wrong? Or will they be so fearful of ending up in a, in a prison somewhere that they're not going to report bad things because the leader might not like to hear it? Because that will directly affect the shareholder value. Right. Well, no, uh, one thing that I noticed in one of your articles um, was, I think you said that you know, business leaders like certainty. Of course, right. they like... Who doesn't you know, like yeah, certainty? Who doesn't like certainty? Exactly. That's why we get married. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Um, clearly, you know, working with the Chinese communist regime introduces a large amount of uncertainty. And it maybe is obvious to me and obvious to you, but certainly wasn't obvious for some time. How, how is it that this happened? Well, uh, the ability for human beings to deceive themselves, to delude themselves, is infinite. <laughs> and uh, there was this 
the doctrine which came about uh, the, Cobden, uh, the Cobdenites of Great Britain of, a, of a 150 years ago uh, talked about, well, countries that trade with each other don't go to war with each other. And if we just have open free trade, that will mean the end of armies, the end of empires, and the end of conflict. And lions will lie down with lambs and cats and dogs will, you know, get married or something. And uh, it, it's turned out to be false. I mean, this is, this is a delusion. Uh, it, much more recently, as, as you know, uh, Jan, in, in you know, the, the whole presumption of doing business with China was that as they grow more prosperous, they will grow more free and become more like America and everything's going to be okay and they'll be uh, like Scandinavia or something. And that's clearly not been the case. Um, I think there's also a degree of every generation thinks it has the answers all, uh, this is a different world now. You know, people are different than they were a hundred years ago. We know so much better now. Um, and the basic premise of trade theory was written by David Ricardo in 1817. And it was on the principles of taxation and political economy. And he has a chapter there on, uh, on trade theory, foreign trade, and it's the doctrine of comparative advantage. Okay. Where that, uh, the example he used was Britain and Portugal. Britain was better at producing textiles. And that's because, of course, they had a monopoly on the technology. And Portugal was better at producing wine. So rather than Portugal try to make textiles and wine, it should just concentrate on making wines and trade those with Britain to make uh, to, to to get its textiles. And instead of uh, Britain planting vineyards and trying to grow wine in the in the in the rainy weather of London, they should just uh, enslave their people in mills and make all the textiles in the world and trade them for everything else. Well, uh, that was all well and good, but um, and that's been used to justify this sort of national division of labor on a, on a global scale. But what's overlooked is in that, in that very chapter, in that very book, David Ricardo says, he's got a caveat, and it's a huge caveat, which is overlooked. He says, capital will not move. Capital will stay in its country of birth. He says, the owners of capital are very reluctant to send their capital away where, to, to a strange government under new laws to a country where they have no control over that capital. Hmm. Sounds familiar. Yeah, you would not, you know, a, a responsible owner of capital will be very reluctant to invest in another country where it's not under their direct control and it's really at the mercy of a strange government and new laws. And he went further and he said, Basically, that's a good thing. He said, I would, I would really hate to see that uh, eroded. I would like to see this affinity for your country of birth to remain in place. And the capital, the owners of capital, should be content to earn a little less profit by investing in their own country rather than seeking greater profit by investing abroad. So... Hopefully, the coronavirus will show the wisdom of David Ricardo and, and show the people, the uh, owners of capital, that it's not really a good idea to entrust your capital to a strange government with new laws, or in the case of communist China, a very strange government with no laws. Right, or no rule of law. No yes, rule right, of law, right. or, you know, rather shaky rule of law. Right. The law is what we say it is today. Right. So, Curtis, speaking of this, uh, you know, shaky implementation of rule of law, I think that's putting it very nicely. Yes. <laughs> um, you talk a little bit about the curious timing of the phase one trade deal also in some of these recent writings. And, and actually, there's a relationship to coronavirus. I thought that was a fascinating observation. Well, what we've seen now is China, communist China, has, has, has invoked what's called force majeure an act of God. And this is a standard clause that's in, inserted into most contracts saying, uh, in case of an act of God, earthquake, something unforeseen, uh, this contract's null and void and you can't make me uh, live up to the contract. 
Uh, China has invoked that with some of the energy suppliers, uh, liquefied natural gas suppliers, saying we don't have the people to unload the tankers in our ports, so we are now you know, declaring the contract null and void. The French energy suppliers have rejected those claims. Well, a similar clause exists in the phase one China deal. There is a clause there, Article 7.6 in Chapter 7 of the agreement. Uh, after stipulating $200 million, China will buy $200 billion more in goods and services from the United States over the next two years. In the following chapter, uh, there is this clause that says, in the event of a natural disaster or other unforeseen event beyond the control of the parties, the party shall consult about uh, living up to this agreement. And in some of the propaganda organs of the Chinese Communist Party, they've said, well, of course, the coronavirus makes it uh, difficult for us to comply with this, these purchase requirements of the deal. And we would hope the United States would understand this. Well, you've got... Sounds it. reasonable, actually. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I, I'm not disputing that. Uh, that that is a you know understandable uh, thing to say. You have to remember though that the first patient was infected with the coronavirus on or about December first. The Chinese authorities knew about the infection in Wuhan by the middle of December, and undisputable fact they reported it to the World Health Organization on December 31st. They signed this deal with the United States, the China trade deal, on January 15th. My point being, when they signed the deal, they already knew they had this virus problem. One could argue that they didn't know the full dimensions of it, but there are many things we don't know about China, but we do know that they knew about it, in which case, you could not say the coronavirus was unexpected because they knew about it already. So uh, I'm just laying out the facts. I mean, so if anybody tries to say, well, this was unforeseen, well, you did know about it when you signed the deal. You already knew you had it. You'd already told the World Health Organization there was this outbreak in, in, in Wuhan. They were already had already arrested doctors who had reported it, and they had already activated their security and, and communication and information uh, enforcement apparatus to uh, stop the spread of knowledge about the virus, if not stop the spread of the virus itself. So are you suggesting that there's kind of, there was, it was disingenuous somehow in the signing, or there's an expectation of not complying, or? Well, I'm, I'm just saying that we have to keep this in mind. Let's keep all, all dimensions in mind. Uh, did, they, did they have no intention of living up to this agreement when they signed it? And is that why they had that clause in there? I'm not saying that. I don't know. I'm just asking questions. Okay. But we, we have to be aware. And I believe that the, the phase one trade agreement is, is a very small, uh, it's a very small part of the story. The, okay. story, the story is that worldwide production and the world economy is, uh, they're, they're, it, it is broadly affected and will be broadly affected in many of its dimensions, either philosophically, uh, if not directly, by this virus. I mean, we're seeing the casinos in Macau have been shut. Wynn Resorts, uh, Las Vegas Sands Resorts, some of the big gaming companies headquartered in America, you know, that we associate with Las Vegas, they actually make a huge amount of money in, in Macau. Their stocks are taking a hit. You've got these companies like Total, uh, the energy companies, that can't sell their goods in China because nobody can take them off the boat. They can't offload them. The same is true for soybeans from Brazil, copper from Chile, uh, any number of commodities, uh, steel production way down because the factories aren't taking it. And again, it's that just-in-time logistics inventory management. Nobody's producing steel and stockpiling it for years at a time. It's like, if you're not going to use it 
in 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 a few months you don't you, you don't make it there's no rainy day store basically exactly yeah. exactly so uh the 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 effect on the china trade deal i mean what china is saying well if and and it's right there in the deal well if we don't buy it this year we'll buy it next year and if we don't buy it in six months we're that, that's why it's a two-year deal they could make that full 200 billion dollars worth of purchases in the 23rd month and still live up to the deal and right now they're saying well it's going to be not it's going to be closer to somewhere later than sooner uh, when we they, they've never said they're not going to live up to it and i'm not trying to say they have that but i think it's just you know just interesting it's something to to keep in mind um what do you make of the fact that you know by all accounts at the moment um this and and we've had guests on the show that have been speaking to this this is becoming a pandemic uh mm -hmm. it's heading in that direction at least um, things are going to get worse, almost certainly. Um, and the expectation is, especially given the supply chain relationships that you describe, there would be, you know, that, you know, stock markets would take a hit, economies would take a hit. Mm -hmm. And of course, people, which is ultimately the important thing, right, right will take a hit um, uh, in, in countries all over the world. But we're not really seeing that at this point, at least mm -hmm. in the stock market. Thank goodness. Um, yeah, yeah. Right. It, it, it's, is that curious? Is that what you would expect? What, what do you make of this? Well, it's a matter of timing. It's how long does this go on, right? Uh, a business can take, if it's a 15% reduction in sales, uh, take, for example, Apple, 15% yeah. of its retail sales uh, revenue comes from China. Well, 15% for how long? If it only goes on for a few weeks, if it only goes on for a couple of months, if it's now February, this started in January. Right. If this is over by the end of the first quarter, how long? And each company and each industry will be different. Okay. The the sales of automobiles in China has dropped tremendously. Uh, I think it's twenty percent or something, or it's at twenty percent of what it was. But for how long will this go on? If the virus and the outbreak is over by April and everybody's back to work and the supply chains are back to normal and the stores are open and it's business as usual, everything will probably, everything should be okay. I mean, businesses can absorb a 15% loss for a limited amount of time. So it's a matter of how long does this go on? That's really the question here. And we all hope for a rapid uh, return to normalcy. As, as Warren G. Harding promised the American people when he ran for president, a return to normalcy. We hope for a return to normalcy. I also hope that business has taken, and the captains of industry have taken the lesson that we can't gamble everything on concentrating our, our supply chains in a country with such shaky rule of law and, and really black box, opaque lack of transparency uh, dis, uh, in addition to its horrible human rights practices as communist China. But now there's, there's this belief that the virus, and, and a hope, a hope that the virus will peter out, disappear, come the warm weather. Uh, right. I, I do, and I've read these reports that, of course, you have to look at the fact that there are many cases of the virus in Singapore, and in Singapore, it's currently 80 degrees. So it doesn't seem like warm weather is necessarily uh, the panacea that's going to cure this thing. But we don't know. Uh, again, there are so many unknown questions because the epidemiologists and the experts have not had free access, have not been allowed into China, and have not had access to the information they need. How contagious is the virus? Is the contagion uh, a function of people being in a closed space? See, like flu viruses uh, rage during the winter months. Is it because, and, and this, uh, an epidemiologist can tell you about the flu virus. I'm not one. I didn't, I, I don't play one on TV and I didn't sleep in a Holiday Inn last night. But is the contagion a factor of the people are in close quarters during the winter months? Is that why it's transmitted? Or is the warm weather ambient temperature enough to kill the virus? So these are questions we don't have answers to. Uh, and it would be wonderful if our people from the CDC were allowed into China and could start asking these questions. 
and, and, and the World Health Organization. That's another uh, issue that I would like to discuss here is I feel another lesson to be taken from this outbreak, which I desperately hope ends soon and with, with a minimal loss of life and, and long-term damage to anyone, uh, minimal infections, is the effect, the, the, I think the more virulent contagion that the world has to deal with is the Chinese Communist Party itself. Its lack of transparency, its, uh, the, its habitual secrecy, the bureaucrats and the officials desire to cover their behinds and they're afraid to report bad news because they don't want to uh, invoke the displeasure of the emperor. Uh, that's, that's what led to this outbreak. That, that's what led it to get out of hand in the first place. And uh, and, and we've seen that the influence of the Chinese Communist Party and its authoritarian governing uh, style is infecting. It goes far beyond the borders of China, as similar to the virus itself, the, to the coronavirus has gone beyond the borders of China. And now we see that the Chinese Communist Party, is, its, its malign influence is spreading throughout the United Nations. Uh, the most glaring example has been a reluctance to criticize China's imprisonment of, of the Uyghurs in Western China in internment camps, concentration camps, perhaps two million of them, of these people. Uh, but another example uh, is what's happened with the World Health Organization. The World Health Organization has been criticized for delaying the declaration of a global health emergency around coronavirus. And you have to wonder why. And it was only after Dr. Tedros went to Beijing weeks, weeks into this outbreak that he then did declare a global health emergency. And this was after a big hue and cry on the global scale. And in there, while issuing the declaration, there was a caveat recommending against travel restrictions to and from China. Now, that recommendation uh, against travel restrictions was widely, and I would say wisely, ignored. Many countries said, well, we're not taking any chances here. So uh, you have to wonder, has Be Nice to China infected the World Health Organization uh, the way it's infected the United Nations? the way it's infected the National Basketball Association, the way it's infected many companies that depend on China for a chunk of its revenues. Because the World Health Organization, very little known or not widely known, is constantly going around the world begging for money, asking member states to contribute to its budget. It, and it now has this very ambitious project to promote universal health care on a global scale. That's its number one, uh, n number one goal or something. Uh, I have a feeling that's now become number two after coronavirus, but, uh, and, but it doesn't have the money for its basic functions. So it's dependent on the kindness of strangers or the, uh, the, the largesse of member states. So uh, it, I, I'm not accusing anybody of anything, but the questions have been raised. I mean, there's been widespread criticism. Right. I mean, I, what strikes me is the WHO is in kind of a difficult position with respect to China because clearly it's 1.4 billion odd people, mm -hmm. right? And so, and so the impact of China on the rest of the world, uh, from a health perspective, as we're seeing, is obviously considerable. So, and but the Chinese Communist Party you know, has a lot of strings attached to access. It doesn't have strings, everything. It, it doesn't have strings, it has chains right. attached, I would say. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So I, I mean, I'm trying to put myself in the position of someone trying to, 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 to deal with this kind of reality. Right. It's difficult, it would be, it would be extremely yeah. difficult. No, right? that's right, yeah. that's exactly yeah. right. This goes right back to the basic premise that uh, the, the hope always was by bringing China into the family of nations, they would start 
the Chinese Communist Party would start to conform to the norms right. that have existed. But instead, what we're seeing is all of those international institutions are starting to conform to the culture of the Communist Party of right. China. And this is very disturbing. Uh, there's a story in the Wall Street Journal uh, about the widespread criticism of the WTO. And there was a line in the story saying, the WTO be, has never before had to deal with, the, with a country with the economic and political clout of China. And I'm thinking, yes, it has. That country was called the United States of America, and it never faced a problem like this. It's the secrecy of the Chinese communist system that is causing these problems, I would submit. You know, one of the, th as, as you're speaking about this, and I've been thinking about this a bit, I mean, effectively, because of this uh, structure where Taiwan is excluded, I mean, I think by official doctrine for the WHO, basically China is responsible for the WHO related functions of Taiwan. So Taiwan mm. is dependent on China. Oh, isn't that interesting? Yes. <laughs> yeah. And that's, and of course, that's very disturbing given the the lack of the transparent information or in some cases even structurally an inability to get it in the first place. Right. These are not medical considerations. If you were to make the choice simply on medical considerations, of course Taiwan would be allowed. So we're talking about global public health. It's like time to put politics aside here, like what's good for the, the human body, right? And, and so China uses its investment abroad and, uh, as a lever to extract political concessions. It's invested $200 million in building conference centers in Ethiopia, the homeland of the new World Health Organization head, uh, a headquarters for the Africa Center for Disease Control. They want to build the headquarters for the African Center for Disease Control in Ethiopia. The United States is objecting and telling Ethiopia, don't let them do it, that, 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 play, that, that headquarters will be bugged and the Chinese Communist Party will have access to some of the most virulent pathogens on the face of the earth, Ebola virus, et cetera, et cetera, because that type of research will be going on in this building and you cannot allow that to go forward. Um, so we see that China uses its influence, for it's a malign influence, to pressure uh, other countries to toe the line. The, the social credit score system that it has on its own citizens, it's using that on foreign companies as well. It's telling companies, uh, you better do what the Communist Party wants or we're not gonna let you do business. So it's exporting its style of authoritarian government around the world. So I see the, the, the Communist Party as the more virulent and perhaps more dangerous contagion because we know that, well, we don't know, but it's a pretty safe bet that whatever happens to the coronavirus in April or May of this year when the warm weather comes to Wuhan, the Chinese Communist Party is not going away in May. Though we can always hope. <laughs> so, Curtis, this is clearly taking, coronavirus is clearly taking a toll, you know, definitely on the Chinese people, on the I mean, legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, and also, and it's really interesting to me that there is this potential silver lining of exposing some of the the real challenges that the Communist Party poses to the world and potentially rethinking how these relationships function for the benefit of everybody. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that, that's kind of what that's that's what's coming out for me out of this interview. What do you what what do you see as a as a you know going forward here? Like what, what, what where do you think things should go? Yeah, I think that's very well put. It has exposed the true nature of the communist Chinese governance system and the dangers of it. I hope, as I'm sure all of us do, for a quick abatement of this disease right. outbreak. And I hope that people uh, will take the lessons, uh, the leadership uh, in the West will take the lessons and see the dangers of putting all your eggs in the basket of uh, a basket held by General Secretary Xi Jinping a totalitarian, uh, secret, 
opaque, self-serving, self-dealing system that's interested in one thing and one thing only, which is holding on to its own power and will subordinate the economic and medical well-being, health well-being of the world to that one goal. Uh, the, the lesson going forward that I hope people see is that when you have these increasingly complex interdependent systems, you are setting the stage for a massive problem on a global scale. Uh, you have cybersecurity experts always talk about having an air gap. Don't link all your systems together because then they're all susceptible to infection by a virus, by a computer they're virus. Vulnerable or they're vulnerable. They're vulnerable, right. Yeah. So you want to have a break. You want to have a circuit breaker. You want to have something, uh, separation. And I think that uh, we need to take that and apply that lesson to on an economic scale. We need to have independence. We can't be totally dependent on, on, on a sole source, whether it's in China or whether it's in Belarus or whether wherever it is. We want to the greatest degree possible have independence and be responsible for our own well-being. It doesn't mean cutting off other people or uh, not trading. That, that's not what we're talking about here. But there is no reason that we should be, be in a position where we're putting our health and well-being, economic and human well-being, and, and our values uh, at the mercy of a blatantly hostile uh, regime whose values are antithetical to our own. And to sum up, I hope that the captains of industry and the political leaders in America take the lesson that we want to keep the center of gravity here in the United States so that we can maintain our independence in an interdependent world and not put all our eggs in the basket of a blatantly hostile regime that is not transparent, not open, and in so many ways antithetical to our own values. Curtis Ellis, such a pleasure to speak with you again. Thank you.